Maybe the second time is a try. Oh, Ooh, a we are live. There we go. All right, so now I get to push the live now tweet. And my First time was a fail. Time. Second time is a, a charm. Yeah. There we go. Thanks for joining us once again. I'm Sammy K. Powers, and this is the PHP Roundtable. This is a live podcast of developers discussing topics that PHP nerds care about. And the ultimate goal of this podcast is to learn a little something from each other. If you're lift, listening live and you want to be a part of this little shindig, send a tweet to the PHP Roundtable with a question or a comment, snarky comment, and we'll try to get your question and or snarky com comment addressed live on air if we can. So today, we're going to the center of the PHP universe, if you will, by digging deep into the PHP source code. The PHP source code is made up of many components like the scanner, the parser, the new AST layer, the compiler, and on and on. And we're going to be talking about all those things to learn a little bit more about how the PHP sausage is made. Just a heads up, this is going to be a pretty advanced discussion about PHP source. Um, so we're going to assume you have a little bit of a basic internals knowledge for this conversation. Um, so if you are a complete newbie to PHP internals um, and you're like, you're like, what's going on here? Um, there's a couple of episodes you can listen to. We've actually done quite a few episodes in the past about PHP internals. Um, just to list a few, actually, these are all of them. But in <laughs> episode five, we talked about uh, we had like a uh, PHP internals, past, present, and future, and it was like kind of like a general overall, 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 bleh, overall arching, overarching, overarching kind of look at about PHP internals. Episode twenty-five, we talked to the PHP seven uh, seven point release managers, and in episode thirty-eight, we had an RFC show and tell, and in fifty-one, we talked about what happened to PHP six. And in episode 59, we talked about what went on behind the scenes of PHP 7.1. So if you're a total newbie to PHP internals, uh, check out those episodes. Uh, and then this episode might make a little bit more sense. That was a long intro. I usually ask each guest um, for their one-liner intro before going live. But for this guest, we only have one guest, one very special guest, to talk about PHP source code. And I came up with the intro for her. So here we go. Longtime PHP internals contributor, one of the release managers for PHP 7.2, one of the masterminds behind Facebook's HHVM, and she has an expletive for her middle name. It's Sarah Expletive Goldman. Welcome, Sarah. <laughs> See, I think I wish you would have uh, asked me for a one-line intro because I, I came up with the perfect one a day or two ago, and I just like. Oh, really? This describes me. Je suis Yolo. <laughs> that is perfect. <laughs> but I guess well, yours works too. <laughs> um, I really appreciate you coming on again. You've been on quite a few times, and uh, we've gotten together and hacked together sometimes. You were in uh, Chicago not too long ago. We got to hack on the parser mm -hmm. a little bit um, and have some good times. I've learned so much from just watching you do a thousand git commands in one line. You're just like in this in the CLI. It's git blah 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 and and get blah, 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 and, and get blah, blah, blah. And then like after a thousand lines, you just press enter and then like a billion things happen. I'm like, I, I'm, I'm just, my mind is blown. <laughs> I, it's just, things take a while and I don't want to have to wait for them to finish. Like I am at my core, at my center, an insanely lazy human being and <laughs> impatient as well. So um, if I can just like, just do that thing and then get out of the way, it's great. Um, <laughs> and I love get aliases for exactly that reason. Um, yes, I just I just started this new work here today uh, a month ago, and I've already like made a whole bunch of bonus Git commands. So while my coworkers are typing like you know uh, Python this push this arg push that arg blah 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 figure out these things from Git logs, I just have a script. I just say Git code review, and it just like does everything. Nice. And, and my coworker was looking over my shoulder and was like, "What was that?" I'm like, <laughs> "That's sloth." <laughs> you've turned me into you've turned me from a git merge to a git rebase person that was my that was that's been my most recent um uh i guess change that you've influenced on me <laughs> from the last hangout um i feel like merge versus rebase is turning into this vim versus emacs kind of war of like mm. well stop you're both right i just happen to be more right than you <laughs> I mean, we can, we can sit here and talk about Git all day. Um, certainly, there are many ways to use Git correctly, and there are many ways to make Git do, I was about to give you an explicit rating, uh, do what you want it to do. Um, 
<laughs> but uh, that's a completely different conversation for another time. And maybe we'll have a PHP roundtable with some more guests and talking about how Git is awesome. And um, God, I just had to reinstall Subversion the other day to get to the PHP docs repository, and I, I needed a shower afterwards. And, <laughs> I and saw that. It's that tweet. remarkable how much better Git is than Subversion or CVS or name your poison. Um, Absolutely. Materials. Mercurial is, is probably Git's only real like competitor in that kind of space. When I started contributing to the PHP documentation and you have to check out all those repos with SVN still, that, that mm -hmm. was I had to go back to the like late nineties when I was using SVN to really remember like well, wait a minute, if I press like git or not git SVN commit, it like pushes it to like the everyone That's else and SVM what? commit is git push. Like it's just like <laughs> okay, we're done. There it is. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, no one else uh, wrote something before I just did this. Um, um, okay, we gotta get we gotta get into the the topic. But before we do, real quick, uh, yeah, what are we talking about? Uh, yeah, what are we talking about? Um, you are the one of the release managers for PHP seven point two. So seven point two is alpha three already, right? I know, right? All oh. of the alphas that are going to be released are released. We're going to beta next. <laughs> so um, the more importantly, we're going to feature freeze in about two weeks. So uh, all those RFCs, all those lingering merges that haven't happened yet, you know who you are. Um, need to get that stuff done. There is at least one that um, is important enough that even though the voting is going to end after the feature freeze, we're probably going to let it through. It has to do with um, security and checking certificates and things like that. We kind of want important things like that to actually get in. But um, you know the the more trivial things like hey I want to add a function to this thing that does something I could probably do in user space I'm gonna be like no mm -mm. right not not on my watch <laughs> well the retry keyword will not be making it into seven point two um, that's just because it needs a little bit more discussion and time I, I was gonna I I did actually put the RFC up uh, in time before the feature freeze. Um, but it pushed that yes, so close <laughs> to the, the deadline. And everybody was like, mm, maybe we should spend a little bit more time on this. And I was like, yeah, we're, we probably should. So that's I, not I, As cool as I think retry is, um, you and I both know that it doesn't actually do anything you can't already do in the language more verbosely. So right. like, it's just that's not one of those things that's going to make that, uh, that feature freeze exception. Sorry. Absolutely. Oh, no, I, I would I not touch a fence. Yes, <laughs> and, and ultimately, it's a it's a very it's been a very educational process for me. Um, no matter what happens, I don't think it'll pass. I really hope it does, but uh, I I think Nikita Pavlov gave the RFC a, a zero point zero zero. I don't know how many zeros was uh, one percent chance of passing. <laughs> I know he's definitely against it. Well, the um, syntactic sugar ones always have a, a a necessarily lower chance, just because the argument is you can do this already go away and stop complicating the language. Or as, as Zev once said in a, a famous email, give the language a rest already. Um, right. <laughs> there's, there's definitely a conservative streak that runs through um, internals development sometimes. So. True, true. Sketch on Twitter is giving a snarky comment. Git is better than PHP. There's your snarky comment, he says. <laughs> Thanks, Sketch. <laughs> uh, feature. Uh, Cal Evans was saying that feature freeze is a feature slushy. <laughs> oh, so yes, we Cal just uh, Cal and I just sat down for a conversation maybe two weeks ago, um, and we we did talk about sort of the the um, the consequences of a feature freeze, and um, I think we did we described uh, beta as a feature slushy because it's not completely frozen; you can still kind of sneak things in, and then the RC period, which comes after beta as sort of a sweaty ice cube, I think used. <laughs> it's a lot closer to frozen, but there's some there's some liquid ablation going on on the outside. It's if you really, really, really got to merge something in, we can make it happen because it's just code. But yeah, that happened with the to. the C springs in PHP seven. There was a, a pretty crucial uh, yeah a change when it, it was already an e RC maybe two, mm -hmm. and the uh, it was failing open. So like if if it wasn't able to generate random bytes securely, it would just return false and raise a warning. So that was a big problem. <laughs> I mean, who, who implemented C three uh, anyway? Shoot, sorry. Where did that come from? 
it was it was definitely an oversight um <laughs> but it got it got pushed in uh in in R, uh, rc3 i think and it was like or i don't even know if it even hit an rc before it actually went <laughs> for the but for the live that thing is the kind, a great example of the kind of thing that can get into that sweaty ice cube of mm -hmm. yeah we're f we're frozen but we're frozen in a fundamentally broken way so <laughs> Get out the hair dryer, melt the ice cube a little, and then shove it back in the freezer because <laughs> this is not going to work. And my <laughs> metaphor is getting away from me, so I'm just going <laughs> to stop right there. So we're talking about digging into the source code of PHP 7 specifically. And so far, there hasn't been a whole lot of resources out there for digging into PHP internals specifically for 7 because it was most of the uh, resources out there were written for 5. And when 7 came out, it was just like, it was completely rewritten in the back end uh, in the non-user land space. Um, and but that's changing. Thank good thank goodness. There's a, a lot of uh, a lot of new resources out there. We're gonna get to that in a little bit. But um, I was curious, Sarah, when you're hacking on the language, what is your typical setup from your hardware to your kind of git flow to the config flags you use when you're setting up uh, when you're just hacking on the language? I don't even want to guide it any more than that. Um, yeah, well, I mean, like hardware, like I love MacBooks. Um, we had this entire conversation about how to, how to run away around finding a USB-C charger because I have one of the few new MacBooks in the office. And of course, there's not going to be a charger at this end of the office. So <laughs> never mind. That's just my rant. Because <laughs> Apple, like, oh, God, Apple, why did you change every connector at the same time? Um, yes, I like Apple hardware. So I just like the the sturdiness of the unibody construction. I like the 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 travel and the keys. Although the newest keyboards are not quite as good, um, and I like not having to fight Windows as an operating system. Um, w Windows just feels like a gigantic snake pit. And I'm sure there are people who love Windows and think Mac is terrible. Um, it's a lot to do with what you're used to, and you know, to each their own. Fine. Um, but the typically the first thing I do because uh, OSX is not really proper Linux, Unix, ish, ish, ish. Um, the first thing I do is I'll install a virtualization product. And typically, that's VMware Fusion. I did try to use, I really, really tried to use VirtualBox this time um, because I'd actually committed a couple of uh, patches to some VirtualBox tools uh, last year. And like I wanted to like maybe get involved in proper VirtualBox development. But this, this, it's, I've got stability problems that just it was, it was when it killed my Bluetooth bus for no good reason that I finally decided it was over. Um, so I do that and I throw Ubuntu onto there because Ubuntu is like, I love, I fell in love with Debian years ago and Ubuntu is just like a Debian, Debian made better uh, in terms of day-to-day -day use. Um, Debian, of course, is a little more pure. It's the source for all new package imports into the open source ecosystem, but um, I like Ubuntu. From there, it's all about what I said before, and that's sloth. It's like, give me some git config aliases, give me some um, bash aliases, give me some, um, you know, scripts that do my most common tasks. You know, the XKCD cartoon of like, how long you spend a task, how long you're allowed to spend automating it before it uh, becomes not worth it. Like, I just automatically shift everything to the right there because I am willing to waste time automating because even if it doesn't save me time, it saves me frustration. Yeah, same here. So uh, yeah, so um, from there, it's just Linux, right? So I just have to get install. And I, um, when I'm building PHP, I have an alias that does my build conf configure make like all in one. It makes sure that it's scrubbed out old artifacts if necessary. That puts the right dash J on it. Because um, again, lazy. Um, Another thing I learned from you is the dash J. That's yeah, oh, the yeah. jobs, right? Oh yeah, man. No, dude, you don't. Why would you've got at least two cores in your laptop minimum? I don't know what you actually have. You I got have eight. Yo. You might have an eight. Yeah. All right. So you're you know, you're carrying the big CPU. Um, so you should be throwing a dash J nine on there. Um, the general rule of thumb is your number of cores plus one because with context switching, there's usually like somebody not really working at any given time. So the plus one helps saturate your processor. Um, and turns out when you do things in parallel. You do them faster. What? Yeah, that's crazy. Uh, what was I just saying to you before we start recording about listening to the async podcast over again? That's yeah. right. Parallelizing. Yeah. It's fantastic. So we're talking about compiling the C code with make and using the dash J uh, number of cores plus one. That's the, the, the rule of thumb that I learned from you. Now, uh, interesting discussion. You posted a tweet about showing how many co amazing cores you had on your system. 
um, which was how many cores was it again? 40. 40. Okay, that's ridiculous. Yes. It is um, ridiculous, yes. And I was like, holy moly, how fast can you compile HHVM on that thing? Because HHVM is sort of notorious for taking for it's freaking easy. ever to compile. Um, but you were like, not very much not very much more because HHVM doesn't really support parallelize, parallelization with uh, compiling That's not entirely true. Um, so the, the compile of CPP files to object files, those are totally parallelizable, and it definitely shortens the total amount of build time. Um, the build machine I used at Facebook was similarly beefy, and I could probably get a full build done in about 15 minutes, something like that. Um, the not much faster, I said, was relative to my old build machine uh, at Facebook. It's not actually much faster um, because again, you have some like disk threshing time. You've got some thread switching time. You've got reasons that you don't get a perfect, you know, forty to thirty-two ratio of, of improvement on that. But um, it's faster for sure than trying to do it on a laptop. You do it on you do it on a MacBook, and that thing is going to be like setting fires to your desk for the next day, building that whole thing. Um, it's not unique to HHVM. A lot of large C++ projects have this problem. Just sort of the nature of the C++ language and just, you know, once you're in a big project, you link in a lot of libraries, all that linking work takes time. So right. it's just the nature of the beast. Uh, I, I was, I remember though, always impressed by how quickly I could compile regular PHP on my work machine. I think it was about 15 seconds from a completely brand new checkout to a fully linked binary on, on that machine. It was, it was so nice. <laughs> I imagine my new build machine would do PHP just as fast, but um, I'm keeping work on my work machine and I'm keeping, well, technically this laptop's a work machine as well, but I have provisions on my um, contract to deal with that. Anyway. True. <laughs> we're so I, ramble, actually, I ramble a lot, and I apologize. No, it's great. I love it. I, I've learned so much from the rambling. Uh, there's been actually, there's actually a lot of, uh, of Activity on Twitter that it's been it's been high, even kind of hard to keep up with it. But just uh, JT Grimes chimed in. She said, "Started listening to PHP Roundtable, and Sarah MG is talking about sweaty ice cubes." I'm out. <laughs> oh, come on, JT. Come on. Come on. <laughs> Wes Stark chimed in. I wonder if Sarah MG is aware that uh, Morris Le or Levi Morrison uh, will RFC tomorrow arrow functions just before the feature freeze. Um, I wasn't aware he was planning to. Uh, put that to a vote, I guess, is what is what Wes means. I guess um, so. Yeah. Um, we'll have to have a conversation about that. That was a bike shedded quite a bit, right? Oh, it was bike shedded three ways from Sunday, yeah. Um, we're going to have to have a conversation about that because there's no way the voting is going to end before the feature freeze. So, it's, I mean, it's a... Some text picture. We'll have that conversation. We're, we're going to have to have, a conversation. have that conversation. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah. Sketch asked a question. Is it better to use um, the PPA from on Ondrev? I have. I know. I never know how to say his name. Um, he was one of the developer shoutouts, but he, he maintains the uh, what is the 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 what do you call those? The distros. The the PPAs. Uh, yeah. The yeah the, PPA the, thingies for Ubuntu, etc. Debian thingies. Okay. Uh, uh, or build PHP from scratch for production servers. For production servers, honestly, I would actually say go with a binary from somebody. Um, usually. I, it's not hard to build PHP, um, and it's not even hard to build it right. But um, you're going to have fewer sort of questions. So if something goes wrong, you can go and say, hey, I'm using this pre-compiled binary and these are the results I'm getting with this input. And there are zero questions beyond that about like, oh, well, what version of this was it actually compiled against? What compiler version did you use? What this and what that? When it's coming from an official distro or even just a PPA, we've got this great laundry list that tells us exactly how that thing was built and what it's linking against and how and where. And if you give us a repro script, we can repro it with that binary. By contrast, if you built this yourself, then we're like, okay, well, let's see the configure line. All right, now let's show us your DPKG output so we know what versions are out there. Now actually show me an LS of this lib directory to make sure that that's actually reflective of reality. And it just, there, it makes diagnosing problems so much harder when you're working with your own built binary. That's not to say you shouldn't do it, but 
bear in mind that that is a potential issue that you'll have to address. Well, speaking of building uh, PHP, since PHP is written in C, you you would expect the typical compile from source, the dot forward slash configure, then the make, then the make install. But you can't just do a dot forward slash configure out of the box with PHP because the dot configure or the configure file doesn't even exist. Why? That's not entirely accurate. Um, it does not exist checked into Git, and I think I'm getting kicked out of this room. Okay. Um, we might have to press a pause button on this. That's OK. Um, We're going to take that out in post. <laughs> we'll take this out in post. But uh, for all the live viewers, they get to see a little tour of the office. Yeah, okay. yeah. If you want to see what the MongoDB office looks like, follow me. <laughs> um, let me just. Mikola's yeah. not in there, is he? Uh, I didn't see him when I walked by his area, but. Uh, That'd yeah, be great no, to have him on, too. Um, Da, 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 It's intermission time. <laughs> Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all be. This is for the people stream. Uh, <laughs> Why you look for the sweaty ice cubes, but you missed the uh, song and dance routine. I think she might be uh, maybe popping in later to see if we're not talking about sweaty ice cubes anymore. And then as we're talking about sweaty ice cubes now, she's seeing it and then leaving again, probably. <laughs> uh, good times. I think you're kind of cutting out a little bit there. I wonder if it's just for me or if it's for everybody. That's why we record separately, though, because in case this kind of happens in the recorded version, yeah. it will be nice and not uh, not like all the whatever those what do you call those glitchy yeah. sounds when it's a low internet connection? Uh, roboting is the term I've always used. Roboting. Yeah. It'd be funny if you could just go find uh, Jeremy no, McCullough's no. desk and just. You know, set up shop while he's I'm trying to. About program. ready to just go into the restroom and can finish this. Room. <laughs> That's how I roll. Ah, here's a room. Yay! Ironically, back near my desk. <laughs> All right. How do I nice. turn the lights? That's a, that's a big office. It's surprisingly, yeah. Um, part of that is just like corridors and hallways and weird places. All right, so where were we? Yeah, so config, the configure script doesn't actually exist. And you were like, well, that's not actually true. It's just not committed to the main repo. Yeah, so the configure script is not committed to Git. But that's actually true of most auto tools based projects, or really most open source projects in general. Um, we include it for the uh, package tarball, of course. That's part of the release process. So you you build, run that build conf, and you have something ready to go. The reason that we and most projects don't actually include those, uh, sorry, breathing hard. <laughs> um, <laughs> the reason most projects don't actually include those configure files is because it's a generated file that's just a duplication of data that you already have. So if you've got that checked in configure script and you've also got the source files, which are these config.m4 files, there's a real easy opportunity for those two to become out of sync and for um, a later person running configure to wind up with something that doesn't actually reflect reality. So if we just say, hey, step one, run one script. It takes about four seconds. Then we know that the script that's actually being run is always an accurate reflection of reality rather than a potentially somebody forgot to check something in. Um, we do the same thing with the parser, actually. The parser's source is not actually, well, the parser's C source is not actually checked into the repository. You have to run Bison, which is done automatically for you through the configure script. And that will turn the .y file into a .c file. We should do that for the scanner and the INI parsers and the variable serializers and things like that. We don't. Um, I think it's mostly just inertia keeping us from doing that at the moment. But every time I want to change the lexer, I get annoyed because I either have to not check in the generated file in my local copy, or I have to constantly fix merge conflicts every time I update. So, so since you're speaking of the scanner and the parser, the PHP uses 
I always say this wrong because I'm slightly dyslexic, but it's R E two C. I always say R E C two or whatever. It's like I say uh, read to C, but yeah. Read to C, read to C. Now that's the that's the scanner or lexer, right? Mm -hmm. That basically just takes all the keywords that it finds when it part when it's looking through a PHP script and then assigns them just an arbitrary token that Yes. We so I saw you had right. this in your show notes. Um, so I wanted to make sure I gave you a couple of links because I've written actually two blog posts on the general notion of compiler processes and, and lectures and parses. And I'm sure I've given you these links as well uh, in previous times because we were working on the retry feature. But um, yeah, basically uh, compiling a script is a lot like reading a sentence is the metaphor I like to use. When you, um, well, you actually probably don't do it this way, but what you could do reading a sentence is take a first step of splitting it into individual component words. The quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. You've got a word the, you've got a word quick, you've got a word brown, you've got a word fox, et cetera. Those words individually have a minimal amount of meaning. Um, they don't really by themselves convey any of the picture of a woodland creature um, uh, bounding over a canine, but they are sort of the first step in turning just a string of characters into some kind of meaning. We now know that there's a fox involved. We now know there's a dog involved. We just don't know how. The second step is parsing. Um, and that is where we start to group some of these things together into logical expressions. It's like building molecules out of atoms, if we're going to go even deeper with our metaphors. Um, quick brown fox is a single expressive thing, it is a fox that is brown and quick. Um, Jumped is sort of a infix operation between the next concept, which is um, the lazy dog. Uh, or lazy dog, I guess, would be the singular expression. It's a dog that's lazy. And then um, we move up a step and continue parsing that, and we start to group these things together into sort of a tree that describes what's happening in the sentence. Out here, we've got a leaf node describing the quick brown fox, an action node saying jumped over, and then another leaf node describing the lazy dog. So you've got this very simple two branch tree that describes what's actually happening. And this is something that can be analyzed and broken apart and you can build this picture out of it in your mind. Um, in the case of, of computers compiling a script, they go another step further and they actually create a story out of that. Step one, well, okay, this is a bad example because there's really only one step. There's only one verb in this. But, um, <laughs> step one, uh, we have, a jump action. The participants of that jump action are the quick brown fox and the lazy dog. And the output is being jumped over. Um, that is compilation as sentence structure, I guess. That's great. And it's cool to see that happening behind the scenes with the the the, the scanner and the parser. Now, scanner, lexer, those are synonymous, right? Uh, basically, yeah. Um, a scanner scans through for lexical tokens. Cool. Or and, one might say it lexes out the tokens. And for both this, the the Zend language scanner L and the, the Zend language parser dot uh, one's for the uh, how do you say it? Read to C. Read to C. Yeah. So Zend language scanner L is the source code for the scanner. So read to C takes that. It's actually a bunch of regular expressions, the R E in it, and it translates it into C code. Read to C. Ha, um, that's each of I... these little regular expressions describes one token. So there's an expression there that is literally just the string echo. When it encounters echo, it's going to turn that into, ah, I uh, semantically know that this is something, this is, this is the concept of echo. I don't want to go straight into outputting because we don't know this has anything to do with outputting until we get to the parser. But right. um, we know that this is the concept of echo rather than just four random looking characters strung together in a row. Um, and we have more generalized uh, uh, patterns that are looking for things like, ah, oh, this, is, this is a number. It's a string of digits, at least one digit long. There's no letters in the middle. This is the concept of an integer number. So I'm going to tokenize that as another token, and so on and so forth. Zen language parser, uh, we pro plug into a program called Bison. Um, it's, uh, it's yet another version of yet another compiler compiler. Um, it uses a, a grammar syntax that says for 
this type of expression, these are the types of tokens you want to put together to make it up. And then once you've identified that these tokens fit together in a way that looks like this expression, this is the C code that you should actually run uh, with that information. And so Bison does the same thing as read to C, essentially. It takes this human readable definition of the grammar and it creates a big, ugly C file that nobody should ever look at directly um, because it's that scene out of <laughs> Indiana Jones where they open the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> well, I feel that way almost by just looking at the definition file sometimes because it's super recursive and it's easy to come up with ambiguities in the parser. And when we were hacking on some of the, the parser together, it was like, I, is there any way to make this, to disambiguate this? And then we're like, yeah, we can use ugly syntax. Yay, that'll disambiguate it, um, which I guess is the... <laughs> Is, it, is the way you do it, right? <laughs> well, to continue abusing my earlier metaphor, if you're describing <laughs> the quick brown fox, why wouldn't you describe the brown quick fox? Isn't that valid? Well, depending on exactly how you define your grammar, grammar, it may or may not be. Turns out in English, it's not. No one would ever say the brown quick fox because English has this um, basically unwritten rule that mm -hmm. says, um, this adjective has to come before that kind of adjective. Um, and there's this, there's write-ups you can read about this. It's really crazy because we all do it instinctively and nobody realizes why. Mm -hmm. um, the grammar is going to have those same kind of rules in there and it's going to say, okay, an addition means we got to have some, some type of expression, the plus operator, the plus token, if you will, and some other expression. Those expressions in turn could be other additions. They could be uh, function calls, it could be anything. Oh, wait a minute. We also want to deal with a uh, unary minus or unary plus, for example, would be a better example. Um, a unary plus would be like if you want to say dollar $x equals plus five, that's a completely valid expression. But plus now has two completely different meanings. It can be a prefix operation on a single number just to say this number is positive. I'm, I'm reaffirming that this number is positive. But it can also be an infix operator on two numbers to say, I'm adding this one to that one. How do you disambiguate which ones those are? Well, fortunately, we have this other expression coming before, and we actually have some rules in the lecture to help us get around that. Um, it, is, it is a fundamental, simple, basic core rule in the language. We actually have to kind of do a little bit of gyrations to get around it. Uh, because it turns out parsing language is hard, and it's amazing that our parietal lobe or whatever the hell part of the brain actually manages it does such a good job. <laughs> so where were we? <laughs> so so the so we're looking at the the lexer and the the parser um, and they are the definition files. They're not the actual. It, I guess it wouldn't be technically correct to say that that is the lexer and uh, or or the scanner and that is the parser. It is the uh, the the scanner generator and the parser generator, right? Bison is the generator. Um, I think you'd be forgiven for using either definition there. Um, the the Zen Language Scanner L is the lexer insofar as it defines every part of the lexer's behavior. Um, it is not the lexer in the sense that it is not the thing that's passed into GCC to compile to a program, but by the same token, is a C file really the program? No, it's the binary output. That's the program. I mean, you could have this conversation as far down the stack as you want. Uh, personally, I would call dot L, the lexer. I would call dot Y, the parser. And I would just leave it at that. Much as I would call Zen compile dot C, the compiler. Right. Well, speaking of the compiler. Um, yeah, you like that segue? Yeah, great segue. Zen language parser dot Y. If you take a look at that from version PHP version 5 to PHP version 7, it's very interesting to see how mm -hmm. parser directly tied into the engine in 5. But mm -hmm. in 7, it doesn't do that anymore. It goes to, it creates these AST nodes. Yes. So the AST stands for ab, uh, abstract syn syntax tree, right? Mm -hmm. Abstract syntax tree. Um, and that's, the, what. what is the, um, like just a quick TLDR version of why, why we even need an AST in in the, in PHP, well, like you said, in PHP five, we didn't have this. Um, the parser, as you said, would just take these expressions, and as soon as it saw something irreducible, like one plus one, it would say, "Fine, fine, great. Give me an opcode. Give me an add opcode. The input operands are one and one, and the output operand is whatever the heck it is, and that's going to go to the input to the to whatever is consuming that. Great, done. Um, this is a, a a quick and very efficient way to write a simple parser. The problem is 
it doesn't give us a lot of opportunity to analyze the, the, the program or even the scope as a whole and see things like, well, you know what, actually, we've got this expression maybe that's um, one plus a, dollar a plus two. Um, a simple compiler has no choice but to actually create an add opcode of one plus a and then create an add opcode of the result of that plus two and then create a result of that. So you have two actual adds. A, an abstract syntax tree allows the compiler to look at that and say, hey, you know what? Ads are commutative and I've got a constant over there and I've got a constant over there. Let's fold those together and then create just a single add of three plus dollar a. It has the exact same meaning, but we're now doing it in half the amount of instructions. Um, that's a completely contrived example. I don't think we actually do that specific <laughs> example, but that sort of ability to um, look at the script from a uh, from that tree standpoint, like I described the sentence structure, um, is something that the AST gives us in a much better way than um, just bytecode output gives us. Because bytecode output erases a lot of the contextual information that we used to have. Now, with the new AST layer, you also get the ability to do um, what I think, uh, who was it? I think it was um, Elizabeth Smith was saying that you could do very evil things with it. And in fact, mm -hmm. you last time you were in Chicago, you showed me a little evil thing you were working on. I don't know if you want to announce it officially, but you, you showed me a little something that uh, you, were t you, were, you built an, a special extension. Um, are you talking about AST kit? I th it was it was something. I think it was something else. Um, are you talking about FAC? I think it was something else. <laughs> I don't want to say it. <laughs> I, just say it. Like I, I, if I I you, were, one, you were just play, uh, you were playing with the idea of of rewriting the compiler, but tying into the AST layer by building it as an extension. Oh yeah 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 yeah. yeah. So so I was toying with the idea of. Because the, the engine is actually decently separated, you know, scanner, parser, um, compiler, and then, and then runtime. Potentially, you could pull any one of those pieces out and replace it with something else. Um, very often, you see the first three pieces of that pulled out in mass to replace it with something like an opcode cache, which then proxies out to the original three. But what if you just replaced the final compilation step and the executor step, and you created a... a a virtual machine that worked on a completely different set of uh, principles. Um, the Zend virtual machine uh, is a bytecode stack, and each bytecode is an identical side, uh, size. It's an opline. An opline has a register for the result value. It has two registers for inputs, and it has this sort of extra extended value, which is just an integer. You can throw whatever the heck data you want in there. These are all fixed sizes, and for most operations, that works fine. Sometimes you need a second offline to store additional data. Um, sometimes you have to do some weird gymnastics to make that work right. Uh, HHVM's execution stack, which I'm intimately familiar with, uses a stack-based executor. So instead of saying something like, here's my one offline that says add result one plus one, you would say push one onto the stack, and then push another one onto the stack, and then uh, execute the add operation, it'll pop the top two values off the stack and push its result back on. Um, it's a completely different approach to a virtual machine runtime, but also a very valid one. They're both very valid approaches. I'm not saying that one is necessarily better than the other, but I was really eager to sort of experiment with that and see how far down that road I could get. Um, I think I got distracted by work or other things and I just kind of stopped playing with it, but um, it could potentially um, either speed PGP up or slow it down or make no difference at all. It's hard to say <laughs> until we try. So it would be actually changing the VM and not the compiler then, uh, is what you were Well, it would, be, it would become, so the compiler is technically three pieces. It's that Lexer parser, and then the compiler is the part that takes that AST tree and turns it into bytecodes. So it would be cre creating that third stage compiler, uh, altering that third stage compiler, and it would be altering the, uh, the executor, which is that the, the fourth stage that we haven't really talked much about, the part that actually takes the byte codes or whatever else and, and actually makes it do stuff. And that's so the VM, well, right? Yeah, the VM, yeah. The VM, the runtime the virtual VM. machine slash executor slash whatever you want to call it. 
Now that's that one's been, I think of all the components when I was going in there and, and coming up with an implementation for the retry keyword with you and some other people, the VM surprisingly was the part that was kind of harder for me to grasp a little bit. Mm -hmm. I, basically it's just converting all your beautiful um, object-oriented code into a bunch of go-tos, right? And then the VM's just saying go to this, go to that, or the compiler kind of sets up the go-tos, I guess, and the VM just runs them. Um, I mean, the, there's go-tos involved, but um, mostly, so, okay, how, how deep do we want to go here? Um, <laughs> let, me give, let me give some history on Zen's executor, and I think that might help make its modern executor make a little more sense. Um, the executor for PHP 4, I'm not going to go earlier than that, the executor from PHP 4 was basically one huge, massive switch block. And it just said, all right, so we're on this op line. What's the op code? If it's Zend add, do this. If it's Zen sub, do that. If it's Zen mole, do that. On and on and on, down the list, down the list. Big giant uh, switch block. And each particular block is going to say, OK, I'm add. So give me my first operand, uh, convert it to a number. Give me my second operand, convert it to a number. Put them together, store the results in a temporary. And then a gigantic while loop that just runs through each byte code one after the next after the next. Uh, PHP 5 adopted the call DM. And this is basically the same structure, but this time, instead of going through that big switch block and saying, are you this, are you this, are you this, are you this, um, what we did instead is we uh, gave every op line a handler field. This handler is a callback pointer. So when we get to the op line, we just say, call the callback pointer, and here's your data. And the callback pointer says, OK, um, the function you've actually just called is the Zend add handler. And that does the plus plus one plus one equals two. Um, that's mostly the VM that we're using today-ish. Um, there are a few other styles in there. One is called computed go to. This is um, basically as you get to the end of one instruction, it figures out where the next instruction is going to get its execution instructions from, and it just shoves. It, it just throws the. Uh, the uh, CPU over to that bit of memory and says, all right, start running that. Um, what we're getting in, I think it's in 7.2, is uh, what's called the hybrid VM. I don't know if we actually made that um, permanent or not. It's sort of halfway between that and the call-based VM. Um, it's uh, so far the sort of the winner in performance between all these different uh, execution styles. I forget what the original question was. I just kind of got on this rant of like <laughs> the history of it. Um, well, what, what I, was the question? Well, I, well, I was actually wanted to kind of go on with your uh, with that idea because I, um, the like trying to wrap your head around the VM basically is the, is the original idea. But like the oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, but like having uh, but once you're in the VM, you have like you have access to these these things that the compiler is actually already um, kind of compiled down. So opcodes, I guess, right? You have the opline, and you can access the opcodes through the opline, right? Um, and in the op opcode is is based on a struct that has like you mentioned before you have op1 op2 and then result and then you have like an extra like extended value like mm -hmm. piece of data there um, if you uh, one thing that kind of was kind of hard for me to wrap my head around with with implementing retry is that when we were, when we came up with the the syntax for retry at the block level it actually had at the ast la layer like five child nodes which is more mm -hmm. than any other node no other um there's no other syntax in php that has five ch children it's only the right. four is the most and so that was actually one of the bug seg faults that i kept running into and I, I had to figure out how to like shift the bytes over to make it accept five ch children or whatever in the ast oh, but that uh, but the this the what was what was kind of throwing me off is that since I only have access to op one, op two, result and extended value, um, op one and op two, I could tr you know move some data around in that, and I could also use extended value to move some data around. But I also needed to like convey certain other data that I couldn't put into the op code or into the op line. And so I think is the the answer to like where that data goes is just create a hash table and then use extended value to reference somewhere in the hash table or. It really varies depending on, on situation. And I'm going to pop off the stack a little bit there and talk about your retry uh, AST type. Because your retry AST type, as I recall, it had basically um, where the try block started. So basically where it needs to, to jump back to was encoded in there somewhere. Um, you had the um, number of times to retry had to be encoded in there somewhere. Uh, was there something for like an exception type? Yeah, um, it's basically, I, I figured out that um, after 
toying with it even more is basically just hijacking the catch block and adding like two new features. It's adding like uh, the number of attempts and the number of times you want to retry. Um, basically, yeah. so and and when I was doing that, the catch was already taking up all, all the, all the things. Like it was already using all of these these extended values. It was using off one and off mm -hmm. two, and I had nowhere else to put. Like, well, where do I keep track of the number of attempts that they've done so far? Where do I put the 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 number of attempts it should do? Like that was that was where right. I was kind of running into my issue. So I think the interesting thing there is that um, the op codes you get these are read only things. So your particular retry feature, it needs to have this sort of temporary variable of like, well, how many times have I tried? Right. Where do you store that? You don't have a variable to store that in because you're not defining like a dollar $x or something like that. You can't just arbitrarily create an x variable in the, in the symbol table because maybe that's overriding somebody else's variable. Even if they name their variable null byte, null byte, don't write it here, Sammy will be mad. Uh, <laughs> one, two, three. Like maybe they use that variable, nobody knows. Um, so you need somewhere to store that. And I think that's probably what um, you're likely to have run into as the biggest difficulty there, because we don't actually have a notion, well, we don't have a good notion of virtual variables yet. What we do have is this temporary variable um, structure that is in the current execute data. And current execute data um, has a number of things in it, one of which is sort of this lookup between um, simple variable numbers, compiled variables as they're called, and their actual uh, place in the symbol table. And they also have this sort of packed C array of Z vowels for certain temporary values that they're going to store. Um, temporary values can come around from a lot of places. They can come around from like the output from a print statement that's never used, or they can come about from uh, a function call that has a return value, but you don't always use the return values. Um, uh, or even uh, just the result of a binary expression. One plus one equals two. You actually have to shove that two value somewhere. You can't put it on the op line because that is a um, runtime specific value. So you have to put it in this temporary storage in the current execute data and tell the op line it's in storage spot number seven. Go and get it from temporary storage spot number seven in your current execute data. And then the next op line can say, hey, I need temporary number seven. Oh, it's value happens to be two. Okay, great. Um, so your retry needs something like that. It needs a temporary that can persist across multiple VM calls, which is also something that temporaries are generally not designed to do. G temporaries are generally designed to be created and then consumed in the very next opcode or within a fairly short distance of opcodes. Um, your temporary needs to be updated constantly, so you have to do some slightly different things. I, I don't think we can actually really explain that other than the course of the podcast. <laughs> right, um, it gets pretty deep, I think. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, most, the, what's really important here though is most of the operations in the Zenda engine get by just fine with two input operands. Um, because most operations you do are fairly binary to some degree. Um, even a function call, the way function calls work is that you say, start initializing my function call in one opcode. I'm calling function Bob. And then start sending parameters into that function call. This is where the argument list comes in. So we say, send argument zero, it's dollar $x. Send argument one, it's the number five. Send argument two, it's false. And then we have a final opcode that says, do the function call. So we actually execute the next function, and the result of that opline becomes the result of the function call. So if you plan out how your, your feature is going to work correctly, you generally aren't going to need more than those two inputs. Um, I say generally, and I keep qualifying this because we do have a very small number of, of actions that do require multiple opcodes. And we do have this special opcode called Zend Op Data, which should never be executed. It should never even be reached by the executor because anything that uses it should automatically be telling the executor, hey, skip over the next one. We're not going to use it. Um, but again, that's <laughs> such a big thing that we can't really get into on a podcast without <laughs> right on my camera. So TLDR, the, the op line is an immutable data structure that you get by the time it gets to the VM. And so you don't want to write anything to the, to the op line. You don't want to write, you don't want to change up any of the op codes. I'm, you, I think last time we talked about this, you mentioned that there might actually be an exception um, in, in the engine somewhere where it actually, um, there's, there's some kind of structure or, or syntax that actually um, writes to the op line or something while, when it gets to the VM. Or was that, am I thinking of something else? I'm not sure what you're thinking of because um, those bytecodes 
um, the opcache is going to store a copy of those bytecodes right. and give out duplicates of it all the time. Um, and in order to save memory and save copying, they're not really always 100% duplicates. Often the sh they're sharing memory for values. And can you imagine one request writing to a piece of data that's used by another request? It would be madness. Right. Dogs and cats <laughs> living together. <laughs> um, so, well, speaking of the VM, there is uh, the zen underscore vm underscore def dot h. Uh, that mm -hmm. is also a definition file that is generated with none other than a PHP file. There's the zen vm gen dot php, which actually creates, which generates the VM after yeah, this, you this change the definition file. This is one of my favorite parts about modern PHP is that you cannot build PHP without, without PHP. PHP. <laughs> yes, it's, it's eating its tail. Um, yes, so zenvm def dot h. That is I, again, like we described the dot l and the dot y as being the lexer and parser. Zenvm dot h is the executor. Um, it is the definition for what's going to happen. So you'll see every single opcode defined in there in its own little neat block. Whether it winds up in a switch structure, which technically it still can, depending on how you call gen or call or go to, um, these are the fundamental blocks of how to execute opcodes in the Zend engine. Um, that Zen VM gen PHP script is going to create a big, ugly, non-human readable C file. Um, sometimes you do have to read it. Your face doesn't entirely melt because it's not terrible. Um, <laughs> but I think one of the... Uh, one of the interesting things that does is you'll see things like uh, const spec cv unused blah 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 attack in these macros. Um, every single opcode has the ability to specialize for different conditions. So we may have a uh, a continue handler that is specialized for the straight continue semicolon expression with no number, and then we'll have another one. That it, so, so that'll be called continue unused. And we'll have another full complete implementation written into the C file called continue uh, is const for handling like continue one, continue two, continue three. These can actually be co two completely different um, bits of compiled code in the binary runtime, even though they're represented as a single block of code in this definition, because we put in these things of like, if op1 equals equals unused, the compiler, uh, after the generation happens, is going to see things like if unused equals unused. And it knows that that's a truth block. It always goes into it. And if op1 happens to have been is const, it'll see if is const equals unused, it knows that's always false. It elides that out completely, and you don't wind up with that code. So you wind up not having to perform these runtime decisions based on things you know for a fact at compile time. That's really cool. I think Julian Polly had a blog post explaining the reason why we do this. And uh, if I remember correctly, it's basically kind of just like what you mentioned, instead of having like a giant switch statement to like compare all the values and like what, what are we actually trying to execute here? It just like makes hard, hard coded implementations all the way down of every yeah. type of possible scenario instead of a giant switch statement. So you can, you, it's, bas it's basically optimization feature, right? Yeah, L last time I looked, um, for any given opcode, there were up to as many as 25 different compiled handlers. Um, this is kind of equivalent in C++ to using templates, basically. You will have an ins it is const specialization of your template. You'll have a is cv specialization of your template. And they're all literally compiled as different bits of binary code, even though they all look like one bit of, of uh, source code. Uh, or macro is kind of the same thing? Don't they pre-compiled little bits of code? Um, a macro is, is, is a very similar thing, but they are far less powerful than templates. Um, what we have in ZenVM def h are using macros plus a PHP s sort of transpiler that is literally just like looking for these keywords and, and doing its sort of own macro interpolation to mimic what you would get out of a template. Um, it's, it's different but the same. So this is Zen, Zen VM Gen PHP file. Um, since it's like at the core of generating the very thing that runs PHP, I'm, I'm assuming it's fully unit tested all the way through, right? Uh, it's unit test is PHP. <laughs> if it's broken, then it's broken, well, right? <laughs> I mean, honestly, what are the consequences if it produces bad handlers? 
the consequences of producing bad handlers um, in, the, in the immediate are is that GCC may not even compile what it produces. Those are really easy to spot. Um, and in the later case, one of our 15,000 tests is going to say, hey, the language isn't doing what we think it's supposed to do. Something went wrong. Um, is VMGen actually unit tested? I don't think so. Uh, <laughs> could it be unit tested? Sure. We could have a, you know, a, a, our own like um, uh, definition of an opcode and make sure that it produces the right output. Uh, but again, I don't think that it would actually be useful because we've got 80% of the internet verifying that it generates a big, uh, a correct um, <laughs> VM. So I think, I think we're covered. Who needs unit tests when the 80% of the internet will tell you if it's broken, right? <laughs> yes. And go on. Somebody complained that it's not really 80%. It depends on how you measure the numbers. I don't care. Lies, damn lies, and statistics. I will use the one that makes me happy. <laughs> Well, it's getting kind of uh, to the point where we have to wrap up a little bit, but I do want to actually mention uh, tests because you did mention we have 15,000 tests internally. Mm -hmm. That is a lot. Another good segue. Yeah, excellent segue. Thanks for setting up all these segues for me. Uh, these tests, uh, they run pretty slow, right? Uh, <laughs> running the entire test suite takes a while. So a the biggest problem in my mind with the tests is that they are serial. Um, run test.php, which is the actual workhorse behind running all of these unit tests, it has no parallelization support in it whatsoever. It just says, let's run this one, now let's run this one, now let's run this one, now let's run this one. If you happen to have a 40 core server, you're wasting 39 cores waiting for the others to do their, to do their job. Um, the reason for that is largely historical. Uh, when run test.php was actually written, we didn't have enough tests that, that really mattered much. Um, our computers tended to have fewer cores, so we weren't going to get a lot of benefit out of it anyway. And then it sort of continued that way because it turns out we had this bad habit of writing our tests to not really be parallelization friendly. Like everybody would write a socket test using port 31337 because that's so leaked. Um, <laughs> The good news there, and props Facebook, um, HHVM borrowed a whole bunch of PHP's test suite, borrowed in the OSS sense, um, to make sure that it was conformant to PHP's definition. And our test runner did want to do parallelization. We just basically wrote our own test runner from scratch because we needed to like change options to, you know, how do you call HHVM and things like that. So in the process, uh, Paul Tarjan, shout out Paul, um, mm -hmm wrote this test runner that paralyzes everything, and we started noticing, hey, these tests sometimes work, sometimes they fail. Oh, it's, oh, it's, okay, let's fix that. Upstream it. Oh, now let's fix that one. Upstream it. So we've actually, um, we with my HHVM hat on, have actually fixed most of PHP's tests. I say most because uh, HHVM doesn't use all of PHP's tests, certainly not for any extension that it doesn't actually implement. Um, some of them are just in the bad category because we haven't fixed them or figured out why they're broken yet. But I think PHP is a lot closer to being able to parallelize its unit test suite than it was five years ago, for example. Um, what really needs to happen now is that run test PHP needs to be rewritten um, from scratch, in my opinion. The code is very PHP 4 is the most charitable way I can describe it. Um, yes. It's got a lot of globals. It's got a lot of um, strange ways of sharing state from one part to the next. Um, it, it could just do with a, a fresh rewrite. Um, I don't even think it has to be a 100% compatible with run PHP test, uh, run test PHP rewrite, because we can leave run test PHP in place. It can still be there. It can still do its test, but maybe we have a um, run test awesome.php that can do the t test run much faster or you know maybe provide some more functionality like spawning servers temporarily instead of having to have this server.inc include file that we've been using to get tests running in Does in that even work? The last mm -hmm. useful commit was like sort of. five years ago <laughs> on that thing. It, it kind of works when it wants to. Um, it doesn't work well. I think that was one of those that HHVM didn't um, ever touch because our concept of spawning a temporary server is so completely different that um, we've never had to touch it. And I, I think it's, it's got some of those same um, 
um, concurrency issues built into it. And well, long story. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I think that is something that if somebody wanted to take on a lot of work and and sort of put together a, a prototype and get a discussion going, or maybe get a discussion going first and then build a prototype from that, I think that would be a great opportunity. I can't guarantee that we'll actually use it um, because people have opinions and yada yada, but um, I think PHP would benefit from that. And I've, I've made a few stabs at it um, in my own spare time. It is a more complex problem than it sounds, so don't get too excited. But uh, if you want to dig your teeth into something nice and meaty, it's a it's a good pot, spot to start. Now, the uh, there's been a little bit of discussion, at least a little while ago, about kind of refactoring run tests, and uh, there's been a couple of failed attempts at it, and and in the past, like many years ago, and um, and. I think the the number and I oh man, this could be a whole pot. I think we got to save this for another podcast because I really want to get into that, but it's going to take forever, and we kind of running out of time. Well, let's put a pin on that. Get one. to the stuff I thought we were going to get to. Which I know is the five like versus seven differences, but there's so many. There's so many things I want to get to. Um, but I did want to shut the hell up once in a while. No. <laughs> No, this is all good. Everything that you say is amazing. Um, that's how I, I just, you know, I'm just, I'm a big Sarah fan. So, you know, the, so I do want to mention because we're talking about tests, there is a big drive for doing test fests again. This is a, a thing that's been, I think it's been re really recurring over um, past, I guess, decade or so. But there's a test fest 2017 that's happening. If you go to phptestfest.org and get more info on it. But we, um, it's a big drive to basically get people excited about adding more tests to PHP. And the tests for PHP source are written in PHP, so you don't even have to know C. So it's a good way to get your foot in the door with internals and become an official internals contributor. Uh, there is a website out there, gcov.php.net, which kind of shows you the test coverage and what needs to be uh, removed, or, or <laughs> what needs to be removed. Well, yeah, that would be good too. But uh, it shows you all the, the pieces of, of code, line, lines of code that haven't been covered yet with a test. So you can go in there and see what needs tested. Um, now, I am curious, Sarah, the, the, do you know off the top of your head, uh, gcov.php.net, what software does it use to show what lines of uh, C code are covered? I, I saw this question in the show notes, and honestly, I have no idea. Um, gcov is just one of those things that the, the tool that we have for PHP that just kind of runs automatically and there's a website works great, and I just use that. Like, I just go to the website, and it says, <laughs> like, oh, well, here's what we've OK, all right, cool, yeah. Um, I'm sure if you search GCOV, like GCOV is not PHP specific. If you just Google GCOV, you're probably going to find some references. Like here's how to use GCOV with a, you know, compiled C binary that hasn't had its symbols stripped out. Um, go for it. Um, that is one thing I would say. Make sure you add dash dash debug if you're trying to do that. Um, debug, uh, amongst other things, does not strip out all the debugging symbols, and GCOV is going to need debugging symbols to figure out what lines are on. Um, uh, debug is also really useful for just not screwing things up. True. Well, you could, and even if you don't have that, could you use, still use a debugger like GDB if you're if you wanted to debug PHP? If you didn't make a debug build, you could still use GDB, but it would be painful and not particularly fruitful. Um, one of the problems we get with uh, segfault reports is we ask people to provide a backtrace, and they are able to provide a backtrace, but the actual amount of information in the backtrace only really tells us one thing what was the last identifiable function that internal um, C function that was called before the crash happened. It doesn't really tell us what line it was on. It doesn't tell us what the parameters going into that function were. It doesn't tell us a lot of the really useful things. Um, often, that's still enough for us to make some guesses. It's like, well, here's the repro script. Here's roughly the ballpark of where it's happening. Uh, you know what? That doesn't quite look right. OK, let's, eh, yeah, yeah, OK, that's it. Um, <laughs> But not always. Sometimes you just don't have the information you need without a debug build. Um, and unfortunately, debug builds sometimes have a, um, a Heisenberg effect that things suddenly stop crashing. They just run slower. <laughs> so. Well, GDB is one of those things that uh, collided with my Git aliases. Because I used to have a Git alias. You know, you've got like GS for Git status, GA for G Git add, GC for Git commit. I had one called GDB, which was Git delete branch. <laughs> <laughs> and so when I started like getting into internals more and like needing the debugger to like all my seg faults figuring and figuring all my seg faults out, I just typing I kept typing in GDB and it was like you can't delete this branch it doesn't exist or whatever and I'm like oh I need to delete this alias because this is really interfering. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> 
Um, so test fest, uh, get your user group involved. Let them know about it. If if they don't know about it, um, tell your user group leader about test fest, and hopefully um, you can get involved. I think it's running September through November uh, of this year, so we can just get more people involved with internals, which will be a lot of fun. There are some more resources out there. There is phpinternalsbook.com, which used to be just for PHP 5, but Julian Polly has been busting his behind on getting some PHP 7 documentation in there. Uh, looks, oh my gosh, it's so beautiful to see this beautiful, huge list of PHP 7 internals documentation finally out there. It's been needed for so long. It's brand new, like just uh, some of these commits that he's been doing have been like literally like hours ago. So well, <laughs> check out phpinternalsbook.com. And, and props to the original PHP internals book people because they, they yes. put up this book that was, it was this website. It's been up for a while and it's had some great resources on it. But they only just recently like open sourced it and started accepting pull requests, and that's what's enabled this like newfound rush of development on it. Um, and yes. so props to them for yeah, actually sure. like agreeing with each other, like yeah, okay, we can like get a license in there or or modify it in a correct way to make it, it work, and like let's just make it happen. And um, like once they made the decision to do that, like you you saw that sort of reaction. It was just sort of like okay, let's do this. <laughs> let's do this because the Zend engine is not documented. Nope. Um, quite famously, I like to say there is exactly one file in Zend Engine that is documented. Um, ZendObjectHandlers.h <laughs> has got fantastic documentation on every single handler for objects in PHP. And no other file really has much in the way of documentation at all. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it, we need more documentation. And my book is now 11 years out of date. So. Yeah. Well, yeah. so the, the, the original authors were uh, Anthony Ferrara, Nikita Pavov, and Julian Polly, I think, right? That sounds um, right, yeah. Yeah, for, for the PHP internals book, which is now open source. And since it's open source, you can go to, it's linked on, on the website, but you can go to the GitHub repo and contribute your own documentation. Yeah. I added a little bit for PHP, for adding tests for PHP, um, uh, but there's nice. there's lots of at to do's on there. So if mm. you if you know how to do um, write PH, uh, tests for PHP, there's like lots of good places to, to add to that documentation and contribute some more. Um, speaking of documentation, there was an RFC about adding uh, doc, dockety type, the blockety thingies to Doxygen. PHP. Doxygen, yeah. What's yeah. Uh, did that ever pass? I didn't actually see. Um, so it's still in voting, and I believe okay. like I should probably just look up the RFC, but I believe the current status is slightly in favor of updating. Oh, sorry, no, I'm confusing that with a different RFC. I'm thinking of the class naming RFC. Um, the Doxygen RFC, I don't think, has actually gone to vote yet. Uh, gotcha. Or maybe it hasn't, it failed. One of the two. OK, OK, gotcha. we should look this up. Look <laughs> It's, I believe is that is it a, uh, uh, wiki.php.net slash rfc is that right? <laughs> wiki.php.net slash rfc is where you're going to find it, and if you just you know control f search on there or command f <laughs> if you're on Mac, um, you should be able to find um, doc siege and is declined. It is ah. voted on and declined. So um, that doesn't surprise me a lot um, because like a. Even if it was approved, it's going to be a hell of a lot of work to actually go around and put all the documentation in. Um, in many cases, it's not adding meaningful documentation to what's already there because the, the methods are uh, a priori, like defining their types because it's C. And describing a definition for a single method is a slightly complex thing because um, there's a lot of tight coupling within PHP that creates a lot of weird interactivity. And what you'll see if you look at the votes is people who have done a lot of work on PHP internals almost universally voted against this, and people who have not almost <laughs> universally voted for it. And isn't that interesting? Yeah. Um, obviously, the, the yes votes make total sense. We want to understand how the engine works, and documentation will help us. And I completely understand that. Um, at the same time, the no votes from people with experience totally make sense because of the aforementioned um, issues with that. Right. So it was 11 to 16 against was the final vote. Wow, that's close. <laughs> so that, we did that live. Yeah, totally. Well, uh, I know you have, uh, we need to wrap up and everything, and I know you have like some stuff that you got to get going to, and I do too. Um, but I do want to mention that Nikita Popov uh, also has a great blog post out there called PHP 7 Virtual Machine, which goes really into depth about the, uh, the ex executor. You say executor. I say executor, I think. Executor. Tomato, tomato. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, his blog is at 
n i k i c dot github dot io and it's like one of the first post up there it's a it's a fairly recent one it's all about php 7 so if you want to dive in really deep see how deep this rabbit hole goes because it goes deep uh he goes into really depth on um, like exception throwing and everything like it's insane oh, yeah um nikita has some fantastic blog posts like yeah. if you have not read his blog and you're interested in this stuff if you're interested enough in this stuff that you are still watching this podcast after the <laughs> amount of just joint rambling like <laughs> totally check out nikita's stuff um, I, Nikita and I were actually fighting over, um, uh, over chat last night, but man, I respect that guy's, um, intellect and ability to, um, translate that into explaining, uh, what it is he does. Um, so, um, love Nikita, you know, absolutely. Love. I ain't mad, bro. Come on. <laughs> Bring it in. Bring it in. That's how I feel a lot of times, like even in open source world where there's like really just like strong opinions and they're polar opposites. I still feel like there's this, there's still the camaraderie there. That's a word I can never say right, but there's still well, that. Anger is the, anger's a funny thing because it comes from um, a few places. It can come from fear, but it can also come from love. Um, mm -hmm. And when, when, when something you love betrays you, that can create, well, betray is a strong word. Um, I don't know how I want to phrase this, but it is. It comes. It comes from passion, perhaps is a better word. Um, it's easy to not care about something that's not important to you. But if something's important to you, then it's going to, you know, rile you up. It's going to make you passionate. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think that's why we see that a lot in the open source world because a lot. Most of us are here not because our employers pay us to be here, but because we really care about what we're doing. And, and what we're creating and what we're going to leave when we're gone. Um, and when you've got that kind of an investment in something, then you, you're going you're to get very <sighs> passionate. <laughs> and PHP internals is not short in passionate people. It's and loving people, very very great people. I've yes. met so many uh, fantastic internals people. It's not a scary place. Come join. The water's fine. Um, to officially wrap this up, uh, the the. The show notes are open source on GitHub. If you go to github.com slash PHP roundtable, there is a repo there called show dash notes. Chris Shaw has contributed so many show notes, it's ridiculous. And I love to give him shout outs. Uh, he contributed the notes for episode 60, which was logging, crash reporting, and PHP, and also 61, which was dependency injection. So thanks so much, Chris, for contributing those show notes. Uh, there are a couple of conferences coming up. And Sarah, you're going to some of these, I think. Um, the two, so I want to, we've been mentioning tests. I'm going to be giving talks about uh, writing tests for PHP source. One is going to be at Northeast PHP, which is Prince Edward Island, Canada. That's August 9th through the 11th. Uh, if you're interested in writing sort uh, tests and you're in Canada, it'd be awesome to see you. If you're not in Canada, I would be giving the same talk at ZenCon, October 23rd through the 26th in Las Vegas, Nevada. I'll also be giving a brand new talk called Going Bear, Writing the Web Without a Framework. Dun, dun, dun. That'll be interesting. There's also a, um, there's another I'm talk. i that image out of my mind with, yeah, okay. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so now now I'm thinking about it. Thanks. Uh, this, this, there's also the Pacific Northwest PHP uh, conference, which is a, a fantastic conference as well. It's May 25th through the 29th, and I'll be talking about getting under the hood of the PHP 7 C Spring, as as well as bringing old legacy apps to PHP 7 and beyond. So these some great I'm conferences sorry, you coming said up. May 27th to 29th. Uh, did I say that uh, May 20? Is it May 25th to 29th, or is it May? You, May was last month. Oh my goodness, what am I, I'm totally, oh, this was a copy paste error. Pacific Northwest PHP is happening. I wanna say it's like September or August or something like I that. I don't wanna mess this up. Oh no, I don't even have the count. I'm gonna look this up right now. Pacific Northwest PHP, <laughs> Do it live. it is. September 7th through Doing it live. There you go, you got it way before I did. And you have the slower internet, that's weird. Uh, <laughs> this is a fast finger. I said it was slower than my gigabit files at home. That doesn't mean it's oh. slow. <laughs> It's, it's all about relative, you know, things. Absolutely. Um, so uh, real quick, there's I am kind of looking for a sponsor for the Northeast PHP conference because they, they do cover some hotels and st uh, nights and stuff, but I, I but I have to cover the transportation to get there. And from Chicago to Prince Edward Island is is pretty hefty um, fee for somebody who just does contract work. So I'm I don't I don't I'm not I'm employed by myself. So that's kind of a, a pretty big hit. So um, and the boss I, is a cheapskate. It, 
Right, the boss is a cheapskate. So if you have a company and you would love to get shout out on uh, PHP Roundtable and on Twitter and stuff for sponsoring me, um, I am looking for a $900 sponsorship uh, so I can cover the airfare and uh, an additional hotel night um, just for the transportation and things like that. So if you're if you're interested, get the get the tell tell the the boss or if you're the boss, say hey boss, uh, can can I get this sponsored and get some shout outs on on PHP Roundtable and on Twitter. So. Um, I think uh, the last thing is the developer shout out, which we chose the official developer shout out who gets, I think, underappreciated. We were talking about that a little bit um, before going on uh, for all of his work, but we chose Julian Polly. Yay. So, Sarah, why did we choose Julian for the developer shout out? Uh, well, I think you mentioned um, that sort of the main reason for me is all this work on the uh, PHP internals book. Um, he is also a uh, release manager of Days Gone Past. I think he's still active because it's five six. This is his release. God damn it! Verify that too. Um, <laughs> but yeah, he he does a ton of things for PHP, and I don't think he gets nearly enough um, shoutouts. Yes, five point six is the correct answer. Uh, still in the security phase, so um, still working on that. And um, yeah, uh, particularly the PHP internal stuff as well. Just like so much good resources and information there. Like. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you so much, Julian, for all your hard work that you've been doing. I've I've benefited a lot from it. So the developer shout out is a segment that just it gives a, a shout out to a developer who's been um, doing something special in the community, and it's a way to reward them back with a fifty dollar Amazon gift card. And the fifty dollar Amazon gift card for the, today's developer shout out was provided by Zen Training, which is professional training for professional PHP developers. You can check them out zen.com/training. Uh, they've officially sponsored this, so uh, thank you, Zen Training, for sponsoring the $50 Amazon gift card that we're handing to Julian. And the final thing is, to wrap this thing up, we have two minutes before I think you have a meeting. So, Sarah, do you have any... <laughs> I don't oh, do know. I have I'm, a meeting? I don't know. You said something about a meeting. I have a meeting, too, so I'm trying to wrap it up for me, too. <gasps> yeah. So, two of us. You're like, oh, crap, that Good meeting. Call. I to do. do you have any uh, shameless plugs that you'd like to, to promote? Um, I, so the funny part is I'm going to do the same shameless pug I did when we did a podcast about a year ago, and that is I am heading out on a rally next week, actually. Um, it's organized by a, a group called Rally North America, and every year we do some long road rally for a week with a bunch of other people, usually about 70, 80 or so, and uh, this year we are rallying down the Appalachian Mountains, so we're going to uh, see some really cool things, but we are also raising money for charity, and we are raising money for uh, Hope for the Warriors. So if you could help me raise money, that would be great. Um, I will get the link into the show notes, but you could also look for Team No Sleep Till Brooklyn uh, with Rally North America is, is my team. So uh, that's my plug. Nice. Well, thanks so much, Sarah, for, for spilling the beans knowledge, the beans knowledge, the internals knowledge on, on PHP 7 internal stuff. There's so much that we didn't even cover. We just got to have you on like constantly just to constantly pick your brain. and More to more to talk about than can ever be discussed. Absolutely. The circle of, of the core or something. I don't know. I was going, <laughs> I was going for a Lion King reference and it just kind of fell apart on me. Well, you're going to give me, you're going to be talking about PHP internals at P Pacific Northwest PHP as well, right? Yes, one of my talks is yeah. how PHP ticks, and we're going to talk about these pieces as part of it. Um, I'm hopefully going to be a little more um, organized in my thoughts for that. <laughs> I will have slides that you can look at and say, "Oh, that's what she's saying." Yeah, I didn't understand that at all. Um, <laughs> so that'll be exciting. I'm also doing a one that <laughs> dates my age apparently, uh, called "Who Would Have Thought It Figures." Uh, talking about the framework interoperability group, PSRs, and uh, why they matter to you, and uh, uh, cool stuff like that. Beautiful. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. We'll hang out, uh, maybe do a little bit more hacking on the parser and trying to find out the more ambiguities that it can't disambiguate. That's my favorite word to say, ambiguous. Yeah, you had a question on your show notes that says, how, how, how can one get involved in, in updating the language? And I had a great response all set, which was going to be, well, just invite your local core uh, developer out to Starbucks, obviously. <laughs> That's a totally scalable solution. Totally, and 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 twice in a row, like twice in like within two weeks or something, me and Sarah got to hack yeah. in, in Starbucks, and I got to like absorb as much knowledge as possible. And I absorbed probably more knowledge in those little hacking yeah. sessions than I've absorbed in like half a half a year working on this stuff. So it's amazing. Uh, I think we are. Our next episode is going to actually be about Test Fest, so we're going to actually get in more involved uh, in bringing some people on who are behind the scenes on that, like Ben. Um, oh shoot, Ben. Ben, what's your last name, Ben? I hang out with him all the time. Ben. Edmonds? No, Ben. Um, oh, crap. Different heads. Oh, different my heads. gosh. 
Sorry, Ben. I'm going to go in my email because you sent an email. Oh, I got the wrong email open. This is this is good. Doing this live is good. I can't believe you're dissing Ben like that, man. I know. What kind of, are you even a professional? Do you even podcast? I know. Do, do I even cut podcast? <laughs> Where is this? My email. I can't even pull my email up. I feel so inadequate right now. All right. Here we go. Pulling up the email. <laughs> just so. And Ramsey. There we go. Ben Ramsey. I'm oh, sorry, Ben. Well, I've known Ben Ramsey for so? a long time. And I just had a brain fart in front of everybody. Sorry, Ben. Ben Ramsey's been really pushing on the test fest this year. It's funny. You were saying Ben, and I couldn't think what Ben you meant because I, I almost never think of him as Ben. He's Ramsey. Yeah. Ben. Yeah. Ramza. The UUID guy. <laughs> the UUID guy. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Uh, so we'll be talking about that next. Uh, I don't think that we've officially got some dates. I'm waiting to hear back on uh, from a couple people who have invited on for that. And uh, there's some other episodes that are coming up that are really nice. I got to wrap this thing up. If you have anything that you'd like to share on the PHP Roundtable, just hit me up on Twitter. I'm Sammy K or ping PHP Roundtable. There's also, if you go to phproundtable.com, there's a form on there you can fill out and be like, hey, I want to talk about this thing. Or, hey, it'd be cool if we talk about this thing. Or, hey, so-and-so should be on there. It's great. I love it. So thanks for joining us once again. And we'll see you folks in the next episode. <laughs> Y'all come back now, you hear? <laughs>